Oh, it's okay with us. I, sure. I just I have a few notes that have facts associated with them, like how many acres and how many units and densities and things like that. So I I pretty much understand all of these. I've been to almost all of these projects, so I know them pretty well. But I just want to make sure I get the facts proper. Um, so uh, here's the story. I I put together maybe six or so housing examples, six to, to seven housing examples. They are mostly continuing care retirement communities, although I have a couple of active adult communities here too. Just to give you a little bit of a snapshot picture of uh, what uh, you know, what is out there and what people are doing. Uh, some of this you may be very familiar with. You may know as much as I know about it. I don't know. If you've gone to any of these projects, you, you, you probably uh, I know. I know Brian himself. <laughs> so he's probably met quite a few. But um, I'm going to just kind of go through them, talk a little bit about what the nature of these connections are with academic institutions, what some of the exchanges are. And this, the core of this was a presentation that I made maybe five or so years ago to Arodi, which is the, um, the Emeriti Center, National Emeriti Center organization in the country that pulls together all of the uh, organizations that are involved or that are representing really faculty members in uh, academic institutions and of course many of those individuals uh, are people who are very interested in these affiliated uh, arrangements because they're their university right they spent their whole life working for that institution and so they see this as a natural extension and of course there's uh, yeah, there are other constituency groups that are quite excited about it as well. Alumni uh, that uh, that when they look back and do that life review, it was like that was the best time of their life, <laughs> and they want to live it again or whatever. Or they or they're they're at a point in their life where they they really enjoy the idea of intellectual uh, stimulation, and they think, gee, it's too bad it's wasted on all those eighteen-year-olds when uh, we could really appreciate it at this age. So. There, there is a, a pretty broad and uh, deep uh, uh, market for this. And of course, um, institutions of higher learning have one attitude about it, and uh, housing developers have another attitude. And so we'll talk a little bit about the exchanges. And um, when, I t when I presented this to Brian's group at Iowa State about a year ago, uh, we also, uh, I tried to conceptualize the relationships that existed between uh, uh, be between institutions and um, and developers so that we could and we're between uh, between the housing provider and uh, the university what what kind of implicit obligations uh, did they have for one another was it written uh, was it financial uh, was it informal uh, was it kind of by accident because a lot of people uh, showed up that happened to go to the university and they have a lot of connections and when somebody said, oh gee, let's have uh, uh, a string quartet, there was always somebody in the, in the uh, CCRC who knew the head of the music department and could engineer that in 20 minutes kind of thing, right? So you have these kinds of relationships that occur and are relatively easy to draw on but don't require an MOU that don't require a kind of exchange relationship, that don't require the university saying, yes, we'll do this in, in exchange for that kind of thing. So we'll get into some of that discussion. And then I have maybe 10 or so ideas that I probably would have put in the very beginning presentation, but it just like was too long already. So some of those we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, I think they have maybe a little bit of relevance uh, to what you guys are doing, but because uh, I think the greenhouse in general is kind of interesting idea especially for long-term care, and I've got some examples of the Tupelo, Mississippi one, um, and I've spent a lot of time looking at that uh, housing type, so we might be able to talk about the applicability of small-scale arrangements like that that could substitute for a standard 60-bed uh, nursing home. And when you look at continuing care retirement communities, that's kind of the, the standard size, right? Maybe 40 units, possibly but not likely. Uh, 60 is what uh, creates the economy of scale that's necessary in order to carry out that enterprise. And uh, when you do that, it's, uh, unless you have 500 units of housing, 
it's pretty hard to, uh, to balance the needs in those two areas. And once upon a time, when we were building continuing care retirement communities, I don't know, 40 years ago or 30 years ago, it wasn't uncommon for us to have two or 300 units of independent housing, maybe a 20 uh, to 40 unit assisted living uh, building or something like that. They would call it back then IL with care. Um, it was kind of like intermediate uh, nursing. And then a conventional uh, 60 in a nursing home but nowadays we just know like based on what I told you guys about uh, apartments for life that it's just like not necessary to do that and in fact if you did a project like that the problem is people would be pushed into the nursing home inappropriately before they really need to be there partly to do with the economics of the of the uh, of the or the organizational context that you're working with so we haven't had a lot of very close thinking and scrutiny of it. There have been some pretty interesting studies that have said if you have a big nursing home, chances are you're going to have more people end up in the nursing home than you would if you didn't have a nursing home or you had a small one. And in California, we have a lot of really good examples of that because it's so hard to get a nursing home license uh, through our state organization that there are probably, we have uh, about 100 continuing care retirement communities, maybe 120. Probably uh, the newest ones, the ones that were done in the last 10 years, probably only about half of them have long-term care uh, because it's so difficult to license and it's so difficult to work with. And uh, they seem to work quite well, thank you very much, <laughs> without all of that. So there's a real question about, and they, they, they managed to attract people. In the very beginning, it was like, oh my God, no one will ever come because we don't have a nursing home, right? And it's like, okay. Maybe people will now come because you don't have a nursing home because they know they aren't going to end up there because they'll be taken care of in a different context and perhaps a more independent one. So anyhow, that's you know, a little bit of what we're going to talk about for this, uh, uh, for this whole uh, time frame. So if you think about the big world of education and older people, the, the slice that's uh, the easiest one to, to recognize is the one between active adult and these are people, if you go to an active adult community and you ask the question about average age, sometimes it's shocking. You find them saying, oh, the average age here is 60. It's like, wait a second, 65 I thought was retirement age, right? Some of the active adult communities, I'm talking about the Del Webbs, I'm talking about the Paltes, I'm talking about Trilogy, I'm talking about the, the ones that are pretty well known, will tell you that people start coming to their um, making the decision to come to uh, an active adult community before they turn 60. And they often come at age 55, or at least a spouse does. So, um, so you have this group um, who are the ones that are really valuing <coughs> the educational side of this. Gee, I, I want to learn how to speak French. Or I just have this desire, when I go to Greece the next time, I want to know everything about Greek history or whatever. I'm going to go to all of these places, but I want to know all of that. So they've got these, these fantasies about how education can really make their life far more meaningful, and they have the cognitive ability and skill to exercise that in the right way. Now, one of the things that we do discover about this group of people is they're not like students. They're not like, are you a student or a graduate student? Okay, all right, so you're the youngest one, so we're gonna be, pick on you. But you're kind of like a PhD student, right? Okay, so we'll see, okay, good enough. So we'll pretend that you're younger than you are. But um, what we do know about you as a student is that, um, is that you're used to the test taking part of it. You're used to really being held accountable for the material that's being presented to you. Um, you're working toward a degree which has a kind of uh, um, uh, legitimacy associated with it, allows you to do other things. Um, you're a different kind of student than perhaps I would be um, as a student if I was uh, you know, three or four years older than I am right now. Um, I would be more typical of the a group like this on the left the, the, first of all, when, when you go into a OSHER type program or whatever, the ones that are, that are oriented more toward 55 plus, you discover the first thing you do is get rid of all the tests. No one wants to be tested anymore. They don't want any kind of, of uh, waste of time based on memory, one. Two, 
they want to talk a lot more in class, much more interested in making whatever you have uh, to say real to themselves. So they tend to be more, they're making it more personal. They're actually using the information and not to remember it, to recall it, and to prove to other people that you know it, but to actually make it more meaningful. So uh, they're great to have in class if you have one or two of them. <laughs> Not so great if you have a whole class full of them. Uh, if you're trying to do a more conventional uh, type of, uh, of uh, classroom situation, but they are very um, they are very interested and very motivated, and um, and they they see great value in it as well. Now the group on the right hand side, and you could you could think about almost any continuing care retirement community, and they're. There are about a thousand of them in the United States, maybe a little more than a thousand. Um, the average age in those settings uh, is probably, it depends on the age of the setting, but um, you could say between 75 and 80 would not be an exaggeration. That's probably two standard deviations from the mean. You've got a big chunk of people in, in, in that, just in that average age alone. So these are individuals who are older. Um, some of them have needs, like this woman does. Um, uh, some of them are people who uh, are interested in care, more so than they are in, uh, in the kind of intellectual product of education. They want to be in a university-affiliated uh, setup because there's a medical school there, or maybe there's some really good um, internship um, uh, relationships with students, and, and they feel like uh, that's a good thing as well. So they have a different kind of motivation and they see it in a slightly different way. And many of the formal agreements that we're going to look at and the ones that seem to be the most uh, popular um, are the ones that are tied to continuing care retirement communities uh, and are more oriented toward that 75 plus population even though, and, and part of the reason that it's appealing to a lot of those universities when they make some kind of an agreement is they can say things like, sure, come to any class you want. No problem. You can audit anything. <laughs> and they know that they aren't going to get a flood of people coming through to take the class. It's just, uh, you know, kind of uh, shallow, but it is, uh, it's a promise that doesn't have a lot of demand associated with it. So they can overextend themselves in some ways and not really worry uh, as much about it. Be more over generous, knowing that they're not going to have that many takers and it's not really going to be that uh, overwhelming. So um, if we look at some of the groups throughout the country, this is an old list. It has 35 uh, of these university-affiliated uh, senior housing developments. This is from, the, from Ziegler Capital Markets. Now the one they have has at least 55 to 60. And uh, probably they're, you know, if you started to count the affiliations, and these are probably much more tough-minded affiliations where there's more obligation uh, uh, possibly, some of them aren't, but some of them aren't. Um, it, it's probably more in the hundreds if you start to think about these more informal uh, relationships that, uh, that exist. But there are a lot of people out there and this is not something that's just a, uh, a one uh, time only kind of uh, unusual uh, circumstance. It's something that's uh, far deeper than that. So this is a pretty interesting example. Um, this is Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. Um, maybe four and a half to six acres that they bought. They bought it too. They didn't lease it, they actually bought it from, or didn't land lease. They actually bought it from the university, not on campus, okay? So that's a problem with almost all of these settings. Very few of them are actually on campus. They're out in the hinterlands three to five miles, and the only way to get to campus is really to take uh, some kind of a, uh, minibus transportation or whatever. So it's not like you can, you know, jump out of your bed and have your breakfast and then walk out the door and you're there for your, you know, cinema class. No, <laughs> it's not gonna work that way. You're there for the bus and then you go some other place and, and then you do your thing and come back. Uh, but this is pretty, uh, pretty common. Now, this one is a very interesting combination because it's got an age range uh, that's, that's interesting as well. There are residents here that are 55 plus, but there are also a lot of residents that are older as well. And altogether, there are 92 units. Um, it is a condominium project. Some uh, live in um, this area back, oops, doesn't really work here, does it? 
They live in these four-story buildings, which is called Woodbridge. And the others are uh, a combination of one-story and two-story uh, uh, kind of duplexes in, in front. Uh, so they, um, they're, they're pretty interesting uh, from that uh, perspective as well. But relatively good size, 32 townhomes, 60 apartment style units in that four-story building. And they vary in size from about 800 to 1,200 square feet. And there are a few of them that are really large, a few of them that are over 2,000 square feet. They have 17,000 square feet that uh, is set aside for common spaces. And they did this partly because they were trying to figure out how they could create a better relationship with campus. And they thought that if they had space here, they could attract students here. Um, and that that might be a kind of interesting exchange. If they had some spaces where students would be interested in, uh, in uh, hanging out for whatever reasons and they could provide space for it, that would be something that would be useful and worthwhile. So, the, and they also thought, gee, if we do some things like create a uh, recital hall, which they have, uh, they, they could um, interest the school of music and, and theater and dance into doing the recitals out there or carrying out some of the classwork uh, that they have up there. They all also have a cafe commercial kitchen, and they did not, you know, I uh, talked a little bit about this um, idea of do you want to have food all the time or do you want to control the food. If you go to active adult communities, you find restaurants, and that's it. There is no food um, like you would find in a continuing care retirement community or any other kind of planned um, community where uh, the average age is, um, you know, over 70. So these guys thought, well, what we would like about that idea of having food and breaking bread and coming together is the social side of it. So why don't we do that? Um, and they, they have meals um, a couple of times a week, and it's really a social event, and they have it catered by the culinary arts students who are not from the University of Michigan, but from the local community college, right? Because those are the ones that are learning that skill. Uh, and that's another thing you're going to see here, too, that sometimes the best people to hook up with are the community colleges, and not necessarily with the more formal, high-status universities, um, because they are more interested in the same kind of programming, perhaps. Now, the universities also have other reasons for wanting to cozy up to this group, because they, they like the idea of, uh, of having research subjects for, uh, for various kinds of research projects. They, uh, they love the idea of having people who might feel good uh, about writing a check to the university, who knows, but that might play a part of it as, as well. But, but anyhow, the, a lot of these were done with the idea that there would be a, a kind of exchange that could take place between the place and the university, and that it would be good. And if they had more space here, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea, and the carrying capacity for 95, uh, 92 units wouldn't be uh, overwhelming. Now, this is another place. Uh, can, can you say how it's worked out? Oh, yeah. It's 100%. No, I meant in, in terms of the exchanges between the universities. Yeah, well, they still have all of these in place okay. uh, that they've had before. So, you know, some, the problem with these things, of course, is that it, it lasts as long as the people who are there um, are excited about it, right? So if the person who used to be the dean of the medical school uh, goes into the dementia unit, you may not have the connection that you had there before. And if there's no one else to, to, to replace that person, then you don't have the kind of natural connection or relationship and linkage. So who knows? They probably have a good relationship with the culinary school because they work something out. Will it be that way forever? Well, I don't know. But um, it, it's as good as it works out to be for the organization and for the individual. So these are all more ad hoc than they are, uh, than they are uh, contractual. Let's put it that way. Uh, they aren't really. Uh, if you moved into this project knowing that, that there was a meals program there, that's very different than knowing that there is this kind of occasional relationship that they have that brings everybody together around food twice a week. So it's a slightly different kind of uh, uh, way of uh, developing it. But uh, nonetheless, um, many of these communities, and the best ones in some cases, are based on these kind of informal exchanges that occur. Because both sides are motivated. Both sides want it to work and they want it to work uh, uh, very effectively. Now, to take it on the other end of the extreme, <laughs> this is LaSalle Village mm -hmm. in Newton, Massachusetts, a very interesting place, by the way, uh, located on 12 acres of land 
uh, that uh, LaSalle Village had no way of developing. Okay? They would not allow the, uh, the uh, Newton, uh, Massachusetts uh, Planning uh, Authority would not allow it to be uh, extended as part of the of LaSalle College because it generated too much traffic and a bunch of other, a bunch of other problems associated with it. They would also not allow it to be developed for housing for the elderly. It's kind of a NIMBY community, if you know Newton. So um, what Newton said was, okay, so could it be a part of our mission as a, as a university to have older people who were involved in this uh, intergenerational um, uh, educational institution? And they said, yeah. I think we can prove that. So they got 225 units of elderly housing with services approved. And then they had to figure out how they, they, they would require these people to be involved in the, in the teaching program. 